You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Veggie Habbers, this podcast is brought to you from snowy Austria. So my family and I are here for a very short break. If you've been to South Africa before, you'll know that we don't get snow here. The only place you'll see snow is right on the top of mountains. And it's not really a place where the kids and myself are going to be able to, to get to. There is something about the snow for me, which I just find so peaceful. It's one of my favorite things when there's a heavy snowfall and the snowflakes accumulate in the trees. And I just love walking in the snow. It's so quiet and the only thing that you can hear is the crunch of the snow beneath your feet. So we're having an amazing time. We're here for one more week and then back to sunny Cape Town. And I believe it's like 30 degree temperatures there. This week on the podcast, we are revisiting one of our WebCon 2017 lectures by Chris Sink. Um, she looked at nutrition bits and bites for the competitive canine athletes. She touches on fats versus carbs as an energy source, the physiological demands during exercise, skeletal muscle recovery for the canine athletes, the role of nutrition in slowing down sarcopenia, and Chris's recommended supplements for canine athletes. Now, if you're interested in more nutrition topics specifically applicable to vet rehab therapists, we have some great learning on the small animal membership. We've got two hours on the nutritional management of obesity, a four-hour series on nutrition, and it includes nutrition for the stressed animal, feeding the microbiome, and nutrition for healing and increasing immunity. And now these are just a few of the 11 hours that are available on nutrition. Another one which I really enjoyed and really simplified things for me was how to choose the right joint supplements lectured by Lelani Alvarez. Before we head over to the training, if you have not joined our Facebook groups, please come online and join us. This is where the vet rehabbers hang out online, share research tips and advice, and it's a great supportive community, and we'd love to have you online there with us. We've got four groups, the small animal vet rehabbers, the hydro vet rehabbers, equine vet rehabbers, and our business vet rehabbers. All right, so let's hear what Chris has to say about nutrition bits and bites. All right, well, welcome everyone to... Uh my talk on nutrition bits and bites. This is a topic about which I love to discuss and I hope you'll find some new ideas and some new thoughts right here and now. I'm really thrilled to be able to be talking to you people all over the world. And uh, so let's just get started. I'm gonna start with this because I really think it's important when we're talking about nutrition to be as evidence-based as possible. You know, sometimes there's a lot of truth out there, but there's also a lot of myth, anecdotes, there's skeptics, there's religion. And one of the reasons why this happens is because we really don't know a lot of the facts about nutrition because 99% of all of the research on canine nutrition has been carried out by, right, dog food manufacturers. And you know, their job is to sell dog food and they're a business like every other business. And if they spend money on research, uh, to, uh, uh, to learn more about how they can make a better product and how they can make more money on their product, well, that's their right. They don't have to publish the research anywhere, actually. And so the other issue is that although there are veterinary nutritionists, virtually all of the nutrition residencies throughout, at least throughout North America, are funded by, you got it, dog food manufacturers, because frequently there just isn't the funding to be able to support the cost of a full residency. So a person's, not only a person's research, but their, uh, their salary, et cetera. And so there are a lot of questions about nutrition that we don't have answered. And that's really where, that's really what it comes to. However, if you really mine the data and you look for it very carefully and you look into it and you note whether or not uh, who has funded the research and you try to find one reference and see if it's supported by other references, then you can start to get some of the facts down. And so in this talk, what I'm gonna do is try to give you as much of the evidence base as I understand it, and then also relate that to the canine athlete. Because while there is information out there, not all of it, of course, pertains to our active dogs. And while I'm talking about the canine athlete, I want to mention one thing, and that is that when I say canine athlete, what I'm really meaning is not just 
dogs that are formal athletes, but do, any active dog. So any dog whose kid comes home at the end of the day and plays ball with them for an hour, that's an athlete. Doesn't have to be formally trained or formally competing. And so really this includes an awful lot of the dogs that we deal with. Not so many dogs are just sedentary and sitting around the house. So think about this as active dogs, perhaps, rather than just uh, athletes. And I think that helps us broaden our ideas about what our dogs need. So the first thing is, I wanna to talk to you about obesity in dogs or overweight in dogs, which everyone agrees is the biggest nutritional problem in dogs. As I see it, there are a number of reasons why dogs become overweight. And uh, one of the big ones is that the dog is competing in conformation. If a dog is competing in conformation for some reason, they like the dogs to be, if not obese, certainly overweight and probably not in uh, competitive shape if a dog is doing any of the activities that we're thinking about that involve speed and jumping and turning, et cetera. Another problem is that owners feed the amount of food recommended on the dog food bag. Never a good idea. We have to remember that the uh, dog food manufacturer is selling a product and they would like to sell more. It's like when you go and you read the instructions on your shampoo bottle, they always say, uh, wash once, rinse and repeat. Well, if it didn't get it clean the first time, why do you have to repeat, right? So uh, we don't want to necessarily uh, feed the amount of dog food recommended on the dog food bag. And the other thing we need to realize too is that no dog is the same as the next. And so dogs have different metabolic rates and they require more or less food. Now, one thing that I see is that in the uh, summertime when it's hot or in the wintertime when it's really cold, oftentimes dogs get less activity, but their owners feed them the same amount of food. And uh, you know, you get in a habit, you always feed the dog the same amount of food, even if you measure it, which you should do. So you want to talk to your clients about reducing the dog's food when they are not as active. Also, sometimes the owner doesn't recognize that the dog has gained weight. And lots of times it's difficult to weigh the dog in the home. And so I have a little, I have a little solution for that, which I'll tell you next. Uh, and then there's always blame the spouse, right? Oh, my, my husband or my wife or whatever feeds the dog too much. Okay, so let's take a look at a way that I think is great for assessing fatness. And I give this to my clients all the time. I've almost had no one have any trouble doing this. And I think it works really, really well. So what I like to do is I like to feel the layer of subcutaneous fat. So here you can see a dog and a circle shown on the lateral uh, caudal ribs, just a little bit down from the top line. And if you feel this area right below where the latissimus dorsi is, right in this area here, all you're feeling is a layer of skin, <clears throat> a layer of subcutaneous fat, and then the ribs. So if you take a deep pinch of the skin with your thumb and index finger and grab all of that tissue and you pull outward, just let go a little bit and you can feel the layer of subcutaneous fat slip through your fingers. And what I'll do is I'll put my thumb and index finger down like that. I'll have my client put their thumb and index finger beside mine and I'll squeeze them and they can feel that layer of subcutaneous fat slip through. And now they know exactly how much subcutaneous fat their dog has. The idea is that that layer should be as thin as a piece of tissue paper. When that's true, the dog still has a fat pad in the abdomen. And so this is a great way for your clients to be able to uh, tell whether or not their dog is overweight. The reason I, kind of, I like it a lot is because, you know, there's no really preferred weight in pounds or kilograms for any given dog of any breed or any sex. I mean, the breed standard gives you kind of an idea of a general weight range, but dogs vary tremendously individually. So you can't actually come up with any given uh, specific weight. Most of, the, most of our clients find it difficult or time consuming to weigh their dogs at home. If the dog is really big, they have to try and pick it up and then look over the dog at the scale, etc. Most home scales are inaccurate for smaller dogs. And, you know, you have to admit if, if the dog needs to lose weight and your client asks you, how much weight does my dog have to lose? You're basically guessing, aren't you? You're saying, well, maybe five kilograms, maybe in your mind, maybe you think 10, but you think you'll say five just because you hope they'll be able to do five. So that's uh, another reason why I really like the skin pinch method. 
The other thing is, although there are body score systems out there that grade dogs between one, which is really thin, to five, which is very heavy, or to nine, which is very heavy, I actually think that they don't work very well for most clients. You look at a dog with an abundant coat or a really barrel-shaped chest like the Bernese Mountain Dog. You know, every Bernese Mountain Dog that I see looks really fat, and then I put my hands on it, and it's not so much. So I think this is really simple. It doesn't require any, any equipment. And when you want an objective measure, of course, the client can come into the clinic and get measured there. So I think that works really well. There are two diet strategies for dogs that I've used. Both of them I've used successfully, and both of them are uh, referred to in, in these references below. The one thing, the one diet is to increase the amount of fiber that the dog is taking in. And what I do to do that is I will reduce the dog's intake by one third. This is a dog that would be quite overweight. I'll reduce their intake by one third and then add twice that amount back of solid packed pumpkin or squash. So this would be cooked pumpkin. You can get it canned uh, in North America or squash. Uh, and so this is basically mashed up pumpkin or squash. The great thing about this is that the dog ends up eating more volume, but actually significantly fewer calories, which was what got the dog into the problem in the first place generally. And so once the dog has reached the goal, then you just start reducing the pumpkin and you add back food. And I found that this is a great way to help dogs to lose weight. And they, uh, they actually really love the pumpkin. I've only met one dog ever that didn't like pumpkin. And so that works very, very well. The other option is in particular for dogs that are fed kibble. If you replace their kibble with a canned or a fresh dog food, and you feed 30% more volume, which again, stops the dog from becoming constipated and helps the dog feel full, even though they're getting less calories. Uh, that works really, really well. And by the way, this works really well with cats. So those are two different ways in which you can help a dog lose weight relatively quickly without putting them into, in danger. Now, there was a great study that was done. It was actually done a couple of decades ago, but the, the study itself really stands still as one of the certainly the largest uh, nutritional studies done in dogs. It was uh, performed in Labrador Retrievers. Some of you might be familiar with this study. Uh, what happened was they took litters of puppies. They divided them into two groups. Group A was fed as much as they could eat in 15 minutes. And if you know Labrador Retrievers, that's, that's a lot of food. And they were supplemented with vitamins and minerals. And then group B was fed 75% of what the first group ate, but not supplemented. And then at the age of two, the dogs were given complete orthopedic examinations. Then after the age of two, the dogs were kept for a lifetime and they actually got a lot of activity. They were very, very active dogs. But after the age of two, supplements were no longer given, vitamins and supplements were no longer given to uh, group A. After two years of age, they did complete orthopedic workups on these dogs. And you can see that's referenced here. And uh, they found that the dogs that were limit fed, that only, had 70, that only ate 75% of what the first group ate, had a reduced incidence of a lot of orthopedic diseases. That is really huge. And uh, the other part of the study was that after, they let, after all the dogs passed away, and many of them lived to 12, 13, and 14 years of age, they saw that the dogs that had been limit fed lived an average of two to three years longer and had significantly fewer health problems. So that is really, really huge. And I think it's very important to tell our clients that not only is it um, just healthier for the dog in general to not be overweight, but think about having your dog live two to three years longer. I can't think of anybody who wouldn't want that. And so that's a big motivator, I think, to help people uh, help their dogs lose weight. And even performance dogs, it's quite surprising how often you see overweight performance dogs. And I'm sure that many of you have had the same experience. All right, let's look a little bit more deeply into performance dog nutrition. So we know that nutrients are important for optimal performance, maintenance of their optimal body mass, but also healing from injuries, those little micro injuries that are happening all the time a dog is active and also uh, repair and regeneration of muscle um, after activity. So it's important to think 
about these, um, these functions because we need to provide nutrients to supply those. And the bottom line, and I'm going to show you some of the studies that have looked into this, is that endurance athletes, so athletes like here on the left, mushing dogs, field trial dogs, herding dogs, they use fat as a primary source of energy. And on the other hand, sprinting athletes like agility dogs, obedience dogs, flyball dogs, greyhounds, etc., they use both fat and carbs for energy. So it's really important to think about that and to realize that we have to supply the fat for these energy uses. So one thing that's important to realize is that dogs' muscles are different than human muscles. In human muscles, we, we talk about type 1 and 2 fibers. And when we talk about the type 2 fibers, there's type 2A and B. Well, dogs don't have a type 2B fiber. They have type 2X fibers. And that, act, that type of fiber actually has more aerobic capacity. Actually, this is one of the reasons why dogs are called the perfect running machine by some people. Because they have more aerobic capacity than humans, for example, they use fat as an energy source much better than humans. Now, carbohydrates, as I said, are still an important source of energy, especially for those sprint athletes. But we need to realize that they need good quality uh, sources of fat and sufficient fat for their energy. So in a couple of studies of sled dogs, have you ever seen happier dogs? Look at the smiles on all their faces. Um, in, um, in studies of sled dogs, what they saw was that they tend to uh, lower their hematocrit and their serum album, albumin as they train continuously and race. And it's thought that adequate protein intake is really important to help ameliorate this. So it's suggested that protein be at least 36% of the metabolizable energy. And of course, these should come from animal source, highly digestible proteins. And you know that the most highly digestible protein comes in fresh food. We know that kibble is very highly processed. In fact, it's so highly processed that the, heat, the heating uh, of the product kills a lot of nutrients and those nutrients have to be sprayed back onto the food uh, later. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Now, on the other hand, sprinting dogs, and they're looking particularly at greyhounds here, they probably perform better on diets that have about 60% of the protein levels that are optimal for sled dogs. And the remaining metabolizable energy comes equally from fats and carbohydrates. Now, remember that on a per gram basis, fats have twice the metabolizable energy that carbohydrates do. Okay. So it's thought that sprinting dogs have less muscle protein turnover than our endurance dogs, like sled dogs, field trial dogs, and herding dogs. Those are the really, those are the real endurance type athletes. Again, sprinting dogs would be dogs like greyhounds, agility dogs, flyball dogs, lure coursing dogs, all the dogs that do those kinds of more short-term sprint type activity. So when we look at this in summary, you can see here kind of uh, we have sprint athletes and then we have our endurance athletes and kind of intermediate. Actually, the really, the really endurance dogs are the dogs that are working all day long which would be mushing dogs and military working dogs. And you could look at the hunt dogs and the herding dogs as kind of intermediate. And when you look at it, you're looking at the amount of exercise in minutes that they're having per day. And as you can see, the uh, amount of protein as a, in terms of metabolizable energy is highest in those endurance dogs and also in those intermediate athletes, but lower in the sprint type athletes. And again, the really important component of fat in these endurance athletes and less of that. Note, I'm not talking percent in the total diet here, but I'm talking about percent metabolizable energy. And again, uh, this has been well studied by Arlie Reynolds and Joe Wachschlag. The other thing that is important to think about and uh, that you might want to tell your clients about is if they have a dog that requires long-term energy consumption, like a hunting, herding, or mushing dog, and they should feed, then they should be fed their full diet requirement twice a day. But in dogs that, that are sprint athletes and really need speed, then it's recommended that they be fed 20% of their 20% uh, less of the usual ration in the morning. And then that 20% is made up during the evening. 
And this essentially is because it reduces their weight for those events that require speed. And so the key points for nutrition for uh, working and service dogs, that's something that we need to think about because of course we do work with a lot of those as well in, in uh, both rehabilitation and in a sports medicine uh, environment. We want to give them this balance of protein, fat, and carbohydrate that is dependent on their performance. Okay, so when we're thinking about patrol dogs, for example, we would call them really endurance dogs. They're out there working all of the time, and so they require a higher fat diet to fuel their work and also uh, higher protein to uh, provide them with the repair that they need. And I'm going to talk to you about geriatric athletes or geriatric dogs, especially dogs with degenerative joint disease uh, later on in this talk. So I think it's really important that we realize that we're going to be working with a lot of older dogs and that a lot of older dogs can stay active well into their older age. So we, I wanted to include that as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I want to talk to you about the importance of feeding dogs fresh whole foods. And I, I think that this is something that we've, in a sense, moved away from with convenience dog foods. So... If you talk to a nutritionist or you talk to your general practitioner physician and you want to eat a healthy diet, they'll tell you shop only around the outside of the grocery store or the market where there are the fresh foods. So at least in North America, if you go around the outside edges of the store where it's actually easier to attach refrigeration, there, that's where you have the meats and the cheeses and the dairy and the fresh uh, bread and we know from humans that it's really important that we eat as a fresh a product as possible. We want to eat minimally processed foods. There are cereals, there are breakfast cereals, for example, that will tell you that they contain all of the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you need uh, for a healthy life. But you wouldn't picture yourself eating cereal at every meal of the day. And I think we need to apply that to dogs as well. Dogs really do thrive on fresh whole foods. It doesn't have to be raw foods. It can be, or it can be cooked fresh foods. But I think we need to uh, tell our clients to try their best to give as great a component of fresh foods to their dogs as they can. I know myself that I've seen uh, dogs that suffer from allergies, or, uh, and, and that would be either atopies, or skin allergies, inflammatory bowel disease, improve tremendously when fed a fresh whole food diet. It's quite remarkable. It really can be quite remarkable. These foods have a higher bioavailability of nutrients. I, I was really surprised when I read an article that showed uh, that they measured the amount of uh, metabolizable energy available in fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. And when they tested dog foods, that number was lower by about 15 to 20%. Why would that be? Why should foods that we're giving an animal be less digestible? So we really want to give them as much fresh food as we can. And that old adage where people said, you know, never feed your dog from the table. I would actually say that's actually wrong because there's probably fresh foods on the table that are left over from your own meals. So here are some suggestions for ways that you can give a dog fresh whole food, at least as an additive to whatever product your clients are purchasing. So of course, uh, raw or cooked real meat is a great idea. And I don't really think it makes very much difference. And the, the uh, studies suggest it doesn't make very much difference if it's raw or cooked, but we do know that it's much more highly metabolizable and much more readily available to the dogs. Cottage cheese and eggs are two of the greatest sources of protein and fats, and we know that active dogs need good, readily available sources of, of proteins and fats. Dogs tremendously benefit from fresh vegetables and fruits, but since they don't have cellulase, the enzyme that breaks down the cell walls of plant material, it does need to be pulverized. And when I say pulverized, there's two, there's two ways of doing this. One is by using a juicer which does pulverize the cell walls. Uh, but if, if your client uses that, they want to use the juice and add back the pulp. 
Uh, another way is to use a product called a Vitamix, which is, a, which is an amazing high-speed uh, blender. Regular household blenders don't work. The Vitamix is, a, is a, like a blender on overdrive. Now, if these components make up a major part of the dog's diet, then we also have to understand and, uh, how we can make that balance. And I'll talk to you about that in a second because we want to make sure that the dog is getting, in particular, sufficient amounts of calcium and the meat does, is quite low in calcium, meat without the bones. And of course, we should talk to our clients about monitoring the dog's response, not just their coat, which a lot of people do depend on, but looking at their activity level, their muscle size and strength and tone, and of course, their general health, do they have allergies, etc., and their output. So homemade foods are very popular and uh, with a lot of our clients that have active dogs and really for good reason because they know that these foods are more bioavailable to their dogs. But the problem is there is a risk of nutritional imbalances. And so you want to talk to your clients about educating themselves about canine nutrition and you can provide them with resources to help them. Or they can get an on-paper analysis. There are a number of websites available where you can uh, plug in what you're feeding your dog and then uh, have that analyzed on paper because, you know, chicken breast is pretty, this, pretty well the same as every chicken breast is pretty well the same as the next one. So um, that's, a, that's a good way to do it and it's easy uh, and it allows you to get information about what else needs to be added to the dog's uh, diet to make sure that it is balanced. The other thing is that there are many state labs that will, will actually analyze dogs, dog food for protein, carbohydrates, et cetera. After all, that's how farmers decide how to feed their cows. They don't buy cow chow, but they feed their cows their products of their fields. And to do that, they get them analyzed first. So the bottom line that I think we should talk to our clients about is that there's really no single way to feed every dog and fresher is better. And this is the hierarchy of freshness. We know that the least processed foods are more fresh, uh, more bioavailable, and that kibble is the uh, most highly processed food. Now let's talk about the concern that many people have had about the possible contamination of fresh uh, meats with things like salmonella and E. coli. So I used to have a concern about this. I still do, but it's been modified and I'll tell you why. We know that salmonella is dangerous, as is E. coli. And we know that it can be very, uh, very serious for particularly children as well as older and immunosuppressed people. You probably all have heard of Typhoid Mary, who was a salmonella carrier and a restaurant worker and transmitted it to many people. And then my concern was boosted by this study, which showed that 70 to 90% of mushing dogs, which we know are fed raw diets because they can't consume enough uh, of their metabolizable energy through uh, kibble or whatever, we know that they shed salmonella in their feces. It's been well studied. So I was concerned that it was a public health hazard. What if you take your dog to a park and it defecates and then there's some salmonella in there and then you pick it up like a good person, but then there's a little schmear left behind and some kid gets into it and uh, becomes sick. So that was a concern of mine. But here's the problem. Nine out of 10 of the recent recalls in the United States for food that's contaminated with E. coli and salmonella have been kibble. Why would that be? This is a dry food. Well, it turns out, as I said earlier, that when they make kibble, they destroy so many nutrients that they have to spray nutrients back on to the kibble and they spray it on as a liquid, liquid and those nutrients uh, that liquid material is often contaminated with E. coli and salmonella. So we can no longer blame raw food for contamination of the dog's food supply. So some random recommendations. These are what I tell my clients, uh, and, I'll, uh, and I'll just go over them with you. In the ingredient list, the first two of three or three of five ingredients should be animal sources of protein. They should understand that there's a difference between chicken meal and chicken. So chicken sounds really good. It sounds like it's fresh. It sounds like it's a really good thing. Chicken meal sounds like meal. What's meal? Well, here's the difference. Chicken is provided on a wet food basis, on a, on a wet matter basis. And chicken meal is the chicken with all of the water taken out. 
So actually chicken meal, uh, which is then on a dry matter basis, is going to be uh, much higher in quantity on the list. So for example, they could say chicken is the number one ingredient on the ingredient list, but it's really only 17% dry matter. But if they call chicken meal high up on the, pro on the uh, ingredient list, then you know that there's a large amount of it. We talked about this, feed the freshest, whole, least processed food possible. I think it's really important to change manufacturers often. I will pick three or four manufacturers that I think are, are doing the best job they can in producing dog food, and I'll tell my clients, change manufacturers amongst these. Every time you finish a, a quantity of one food, go to another manufacturer. And my reasoning is we don't know exactly how much of every single nutrient dogs need. Do we really know how much cobalt, for example, the dog needs? And do we even know what would happen if a dog was deficient in, in this area or some of the more important nutrients? For example, let's say your client, uh, the manufacturer buys grain from a place that's had uh, flooding this year. Well, that grain may be leached of a number of nutrients and they may not even know it. Another manufacturer buys their uh, grain from a place that's been nice and dry and has had good, good amounts of rain. And so flooding hasn't been a problem, but maybe those soils are selenium deficient, for example. And so by changing manufacturers often, we can probably make up for small deficiencies in, in various types of food that the manufacturer may not even be aware of. And I'm gonna show you some proof of this in a minute. Grain-free food, I don't think it matters unless the dog has a known allergy to the grains. Uh, certainly I tell my clients to check the ingredient list every time they purchase it, just keep it in your pocket or in your wallet uh, because the ingredients list changes regularly and what you were feeding last year might not be anything like what you're feeding this year. And realize that diet foods often have inferior ingredients, things like sawdust as a source of carbohydrates so that the dog will have less metabolizable energy that he eats. But certainly we don't have to use that kind of a diet for dogs. So why do I suggest fresh food and why different manufacturers? Well, there's an emerging situation here in the United States uh, in which dozens of golden retrievers have died or become ill with dilative cardiomyopathy. Of course, the first thing we did was look for taurine levels because that's what causes dilative cardiomyopathy in cats. And what we found was that they had extremely low taurine levels, about a tenth of the normal level. And then when they looked at dogs in other household, in the same household, but other dogs of other breeds, they also had very low taurine levels. And it turned out that all of these dogs were fed the same dry food. That's all they were fed. And it actually was a very good company, a company that has a, a, an excellent reputation. But what they had done was they had built a new plant and that manufacturer in that plant had switched to purchasing taurine from China. And clearly they were not getting what they thought they were getting. And so dozens of dogs have died and maybe it'll even be more than that. And certainly the housemates of the dogs that died, some of them were found to be very ill and, uh, and, on, the, and, and on the verge of dying as well. So this just really confirms to me why it's important to have fresh food from different manufacturers. And of course, most of you have heard of the situation with adulterated pet food from China that had melamine in it. Melamine tests positive on phosphorus tests, and it's one of the ways in which they tested for, for uh, they test uh, any food for, for proteins because protein is high in phosphorus. Tens of thousands of dogs and cats died uh, in the around 2004 to 2008, 2009 in North America from these melamine uh, contaminated products. Um, and actually, what's even more horrific is that uh, baby formula in China was adulterated with it as well. And they estimate that 300,000 Chinese babies became sick and 54,000 of them were hospitalized. And again, this is just a reason why it's so important to change foods a lot. We don't want to give the dog always the same food. Now, there was a really interesting study that looked at uh, skeletal muscles, muscle recovery. And I'm very interested in that because... Although many older dogs develop sarcopenia, there are things that we can do to fight that. Of course, one thing we can do is to exercise dogs on a continuous basis and not just allow them to become uh, sedentary in old age. But in this study, they showed that the quality of nutrition really helps to preserve that capacity 
for skeletal muscle regeneration because stem cells, which help to regenerate muscle, need to have good nutrients to function. And so the nutrients were highly digestible, readily available amino acids or protein, right? Omega-3 uh, fatty acids, uh, polyphenols, and vitamin D. Another study of cognitively impaired animals, that, uh, older dogs, showed, and they measured um, this BDNF, which is a nerve growth factor. And what they showed was that dogs that received both an antioxidant diet and environmental enrichment had increased levels of this nerve growth factor, which is important for, for uh, growth of and replication of neurons. And these dogs also had significantly improved cognitive function. So that's really important because cognitive decline can be a problem in older dogs. So in terms of supplementation, I recommend that all dogs and all canine athletes for sure receive joint protective nutraceuticals designed for dogs, probiotics that are designed for the dog's own gastrointestinal microbiome, and long chain omega-3 fatty acids and in particular, the dose that you need to be concerned about is that they are getting 15 milligrams per pound or 33 milligrams per kilogram of DHA. You don't have to worry about the EPA, that will come along. And by the way, I'm showing you this picture because if none of you have ever seen what golden retrievers look like after swimming in a liquid manure tank, you now have that pleasure. Those are my two dogs. Glycogen replenishment has been studied also, and we know that that is uh, important for dogs that are going to be running a lot, dogs that are going to be uh, either mushing dogs or herding or, or hunting dogs, or also dogs that are going to be in a lot of events. So fly ball dogs uh, and agility dogs can also benefit from receiving a very highly digestible carbohydrate within 30 minutes after they uh, stop exercising. So that's something that you can discuss with your clients, especially with those really high order, mid-level or um, endurance type athletes. Interestingly, there's been a number of studies that have been looking at the effect of nutrition on scenting abilities. So in one study, they showed that corn oil and in particular high linoleic acid might enhance scenting ability. But then another study, which is kind of interesting, showed that scent detection might decrease with the use of medium chain triglycerides, things like coconut oil. So that's kind of a concern, but we don't know. I mean, I think more studies need to be done on this, especially how much coconut oil and uh, et cetera, but something to think about. And then geriatric patients, uh, I mentioned this earlier. I think that it's really important that we give them highly digestible protein and really, with dogs with sarcopenia, what they really need is even more protein as long as they don't have diagnosed kidney disease. It's, uh, elevated protein we know doesn't cause kidney disease. But doubling the recommended amount of protein from let's say 2.5 to four grams of protein per kilogram of body weight can really help these dogs along with significant exercise. And by that, I mean just moving. They don't have to be going out and jumping and running but just taking them out for a walk can make a huge difference. So we want to make sure that they have very high quality protein at about 28 to 30% in the diet and 12 to 16% fat, which is pretty typical for adult high quality dog food. And then again, another study looked that looked at stem cells. We know that stem cells uh, are important for skeletal muscle recovery. And they looked at nut nutrients that were important for skeletal muscle recovery. So that's really important. So that's for geriatric dogs. Think about that because we certainly deal with lots of geriatric dogs in our, uh, in our practices. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit on Saturday, the 4th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the vet rehab community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.